tea. I know that's traditional um, at CIFA every year. So, um, so we'll crack straight on. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Brendan, who's going to talk to us about uh, deep time. Um, so fantastic. Thank you, Duncan. I too want to join the lovely landscapes competition, but not just with one landscape, but with three lovely landscapes, but alas, perhaps less artfully taken Instagram shots, so maybe you'll still win, Phil. Um, so my name's Brendan, I'm the founder and co-CEO of Digventures. We're a participatory platform for involving the public in archeological research, and we use various tools like crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, or other tech-enabled models to bring the public into the heart of our research. Now, Duncan's introduction um, today asked us to think about um, citizen participation beyond the dig, perhaps moving it into the reconnaissance stage or planning stage of archeology. span Well, I wanna try and get us to think a little bit further than that. Um, a participatory model moving perhaps outside the bounds of archeology span um, and into the realms of nature recovery and an integrated management system for both the heritage and natural environment. Now I'm gonna be talking about Deep Time. Deep Time's a participatory mapping platform for finding archeology span and now habitats. I'm gonna be talking about how we applied that on three case studies with the National Trust this year. That project is just about closing. Our results are in the press and I might be a bit um, stumbly over some of the d data, and that's probably because this is the first time I'm seeing it too. So we're in it together, please bear with me. So firstly, we're a community of practice. Um, we don't really need to restate this, but I think I will. Um, let's begin with the why. Our world is home to innumerable archeological sites and ecological resources. These places provide a tangible link um, our relationship with nature, and they hold a transformational power, connecting communities to land and people to each other. But climate change now threatens this invaluable resource. Many sites face a catastrophic damage through weather events such as and coastal erosion, but as well as that, we have our human response to try and mitigate these challenges like reforestation or peatland reclamation. The scale of the climate crisis can't be addressed by business as usual solutions, which is why the concept of natural capital has come to the fore. Reframing our forests, water, soils and oceans, um, not just as, as uh, uh, landscapes to conserve, um, but as vital ecosystem services to humanity. We've devised tools like um, carbon credits, or the latest biodiversity net gain. And these nature-based solutions are designed to incentivize investment, both private and public, um, into nature recovery. Now that's all well and good, um, but the problem with this new model is that we lack the data and we lack the professional capacity, either archeological or ecological, to facilitate this work. To meet our net zero goals in the UK alone, we need to complete some 700 square kilometers of reforestation and peatland reclamation each year to 2030 to meet our international um, obligations. And part of the reason we keep missing these goals is we simply don't have the data to underpin these initiatives. We can't opportunity plan around nature recovery, and more importantly, we can't monitor the environmental impacts, the uplift in that nature recovery to in properly incentivize payments for ecosystem services. So our idea is to empower citizens to map archeological sites and ecological habitats using satellite data and LIDAR, providing the data that, that can be the backbone for nature recovery while creating um, a real pathway for communities to engage in preserving their landscapes. This is why we developed the Deep Time platform. To mobilize technology, data, and people, a diversity of different citizens, to put citizens at the heart of our climate strategies. It's de designed to be a exceptionally user-friendly GIS for baselining landscape features 
in this case archaeology, and predominantly using LIDAR. And that's embedded within a learning management system which enables non-specialists to make professionally and scientifically valid contributions. Our participants, who we affectionately call pastronauts, um, learn valuable skills while mapping large areas and connecting with others on cohort-driven missions. And partners like the National Trust receive this high-quality, actionable data in their own data dashboard. This allows for smarter, more immediate decisions on how to invest and care for the landscapes and estates. Now, we've already seen promising results from this platform. We're about three years into the project. Last year, I presented our pilot project, which is funded by Nesta, that attracted some 1,000 um, cadets um, for 100 pastoral places. This was applied on a 220 square kilometer area in Lowland County, Durham. Uh, these results um, helped us apply for further investment from Innovate UK and Heritage Innovation Fund. And working together, they supported us to apply this on three different case studies uh, with the National Trust. Purbeck, which is our coastal site, Wallington, which is our reforestation site, and the Peak District, which is our peatland site. Um, now, this was framed very much as an experiment. This uh, new round of missions had two really core um, uh, hypotheses. The first one was about data and the method. Um, can we find an uplift? Can we create an uplift in the quantity of archaeological features as well as the quality of those features? And success here was measured um, through a, a model which I'll discuss in a second. And the second one was really about the people and, them, and what it meant for them getting involved. Does it lead to a greater sense of place or connection to the study area? Could it lead to more climate positive behavior or an increase in the feeling of calmness in the face of sometimes overwhelming climate anxiety? Now we measured success here through two surveys, one undertaken before each mission and one undertaken after. So firstly, who took part? Well, our strategy aims for both breadth and depth of engagement. We want to um, engage an audience far beyond the usual enthusiast communities. And as well as that, we want to foster a deep, sustained engagement with our participant group. Now, we do this by creating a spectrum of engagement um, with different levels of participation and with five different um, personas. You can see that we're leaning quite heavily into the idea of space archaeology here. So beginning at the very top, um, we have our mission control, that's us, our professional team and the National Trust. We're helping to shape the aims of the project. The layer below that, we have mission leaders. These are our, our super users um, who've undertaken additional training to help validate some um, of, of the feature identifications. Below that, we have our fully trained pastronauts. This is our community of crowd mappers finding archaeology. Below that, we have our cadets who were prospective pastronauts not yet being trained. And below that, still our passengers. These are our interested community members who perhaps aren't taking part in the platform, as well as interested stakeholders like you guys, for instance, who've come to this presentation. So whereabouts did they come from? Well, for our, our National Trust missions, we had over 1,000 um, applicants from 31 different countries. 743 um, participants then um, progressed past the training, they completed their training, and then became fully-fledged pastronauts with some 45 mission leaders. Um, this group was exceptionally diverse. Um, there was an equal representation across age, gender, socioeconomic status, with 10% from a non-white um, background and nearly half having no previous experience. I have a bunch of slides now which I'm going to whistle through, um, but these can be drilled into, into our forthcoming report, which will be on our website very soon. Age, for instance, well, the top graph there, you can see this is from a report um, completed by Debbie Frierson, actually, who's going to be on the panel um, later, and gives a typical baseline for the CBA membership. The middle graph there, 
That's what our, our typical um, crowd looks like when they dig with us. You can see we draw a much younger crowd um, against, against the grain of traditional volunteering archaeology. The graph at the very bottom, well, that's deep time. And you can see that al although there is a spike in the elder group, 50% are still under 50. Um, but that's interesting enough that it goes against the grain of our um, on-the-ground participation. Um, in, a, in, in a way, we've enabled uh, people who wouldn't be able to join us on site to still contribute meaningfully to, to our work. Um, in terms of uh, pron um, pronouns, we have some 60% who identify as female, also um, against the grain of typical um, volunteering. In terms of socioeconomic, no one single group um, stands out. So that top graph there shows the 11 um, socioeconomic categories according to their Office for National Statistics. The, the spike there is retired, but obviously they also spread in their working life across, across that group. Ethnicity, 10%. Um, non-white, we could do better there, but it's still considerably better than where we as a profession are sat. Have you done archaeology before? So 34% never touched any kind of volunteering in archaeology, um, with a further 17% who'd only ever done it with us. So 50% is a new audience that we um, have brought um, to this programme. Now this is an interesting um, graph. This is actually about how much time people spent doing um, the work. Now, as a minimum, we wanted people to spend at least two hours, um, but considerably more spent between two and four, some 40% or so. Some spent um, two to 10 hours, and some people treated this as a full-time job. I think this actually explains that graph that I showed you in terms of age profiles as well. We're designing down barriers to participation here, but in some respects, we're also bringing barriers up. If you have a young family, for instance, or a busy job, this isn't a participatory model um, that you could get involved in. So how did it manage to be um, so sticky? Well, there's two main differences in our approach. Unlike traditional citizen science platforms like Zooniverse that train maybe 2,000 people to do one or two things, we take very small, well, two or two, 200 or so cohorts um, through a four-week training plan. Um, quite an intensive um, program that means that at the end of that program, they can maybe do a hundred things or possibly even more, make quite complex decisions around Earth observation data. That's the first thing. The second thing is about our peer-to-peer -peer validation system. We use a single track model where one astronaut's work goes to another astronaut's for validation and through a chat function built into the website, they're able to discuss with each other um, the finer points of what each, each sees. This builds a learning loop into the system, which means that as the crowd grows in experience, the data that comes out of the other side is also improved. So moving on to the, the National Trust missions now, as we eagerly um, refreshed our browsers each day to see how these missions um, were completing, um, and looked again at our two core hypotheses. Firstly, the participation. Firstly, the um, um, participation and then um, the data around the actual um, archaeology. So, so the missions that you can see here. Um, this data comes from a baseline of the National Trust's own HBSMR um, system. You can see that there's nuance and variability across all these different landscapes where um, Purbeck and Studland has some 767 known archaeological features, um, Wallington considerably more, um, 1,300 or so, and the Peak District over 2,000. That's a bigger area. Um, this is to do with how well the data has been improved um, recently. Wallington has recently um, been hugely improved through a LIDAR study in a professional um, survey. So that's the quantity in terms of the baseline. As you can see that after a month of crowd analysis, um, the crowd has added to this hugely, varying from some 376% to 181%. 
So in terms of quality, uh, quantity uplift, that is a huge result. But what now of the quality? Um, so this also demonstrates a variability in our underlying uh, database for the HER as well as the HBSMR. Um, we have Purbeck and Studland started at an 84% quality, uh, Wallington a 93% quality, and Peak District 72%. What do we mean by quality? So we choose three different metrics. Uh, we choose fidelity, which is the closeness of match between the observed feature and the label. We use accuracy, which is the closeness of match between the polygon and the observed feature on the Earth observation data. And completeness is how much of the metadata has been completed associated with those polygons. We can award those a score from zero being awful to four being perfect. And then we can assi assign a percentage rating, which we can amalgamate as an overall quality score. We do 10% of our study area as a baseline. And then at the end of the project, we do a further 10% um, to see how far we've moved the needle. So Purbeck and Studland, we moved the needle by 2.6%. Wallington, that's the area that's recently been um, professionally uh, surveyed, 0.9%, um, so within the same um, sp um, space. And then the Peak District, some 11.6% uplift. So we're creating this model that finds more archaeology at a similar or better uh, uh, quality to what we, what we rely on in our professional um, databases. So what now of the, of the impact, that question around um, people? Um, so this is all about the question of um, connection um, to place. So when we began, um, we asked participants whether they had a strong connection both to their own home um, or the study areas um, themselves. Um, we found that um, only a small percentage had um, a connection to the study area, but by the time this had finished, some 71% um, thought that their connection to the study area had increased, 32%. Um, strongly so, we also saw a similar shift in how people responded to their own home areas too. Um, the question over climate change, how anxious were you about climate change, we asked people before they began, and we found that there was a huge um, amount of climate anxiety. Um, some 90% said that they had some level of climate anxiety. Now that didn't change very much. People retained a level of climate anxiety. Um, but what we did see is that when we, when we looked at it in, in terms of their climate action, um, many more felt that they, they were now, um, that, that they were contributing um, to the effort. Um, and that looked in, in a very small way, uh, we started to see this change in behavior um, related to the project as we very much framed what we were doing um, in terms of climate action. Okay, so coming to a close now. Um, what does this look like? Um, well, this is the third year of an R&D innovation project. So we are feeling our way forward on this um, and it's very, very early days. But what it looks like to us is a new model, a new end-to-end -end model, a regenerative model um, that starts with uh, the data that we, we all um, use, our HBSMRs or HERs, and round trips that through a crowd augmentation process um, on our partner side, our participant side, and then that passes over to our partners who then can make um, actionable um, insights um, into the landscapes that they take charge of. Um, that step uh, three is where our augmented data um, sits. It then passes out to step five. Um, you might call this ground, uh, um, a field checking or ground truthing or some other aspect um, which then uh, uh, moves the needle on, on the ground. Um, that then um, goes to step six, um, which is actually doing a thing, whether that's replanting, whether it's opportunity mapping around nature recovery, or if it's archaeologist is digging a hole somewhere. And then that data goes back to the center again to spin back out in this continuous um, model. 
Now, why we've had Eureka moments over this is I, I've just shown you a small portion of what we did in the project, the National Trust areas. We actually expanded our stretch goal over those areas, and we did some 900 square kilometers in three months with 750 trained pasture noughts and 45 mission leaders. And that's one and a half size, uh, times the size of Greater Manchester. It is a huge amount of land to do and create data for. Um, and really it kind of moves the needle from archeology span as this, uh, or survey as a reconnaissance model that perhaps used to happen every you know, decade or so to something that could happen annually. And this is what we've been commissioned by Natural England to do with habitats and um, doing the same kind of thing, um, looking at for in advance of um, large landscape transformation, um, and that's part of the NCEA project. Um, we're really excited about this project. If anyone is interested in partnering, we'd be so happy to hear. Um, we'd like to see it grow. We think it's really got some legs. Thank you.